All right. I think we'll start, we'll get started, start with some housekeeping things, and then we'll get moving. I know people are still streaming in, um, but thank you all for joining us in our um, monthly Card Distinguished Lecture Series. Um, before I present our um, fantastic speaker, I'm just going to go over a couple of housekeeping things for the audience. So this lecture series is sponsored by the UCLA Tarjan Center, the UCLA IDDRC, which is the Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities Research Center, as well as the UCLA Brain Research Institute. Um, you as attendees can ask questions throughout the lecture. It's kind of one of the advantages of being on Zoom. Uh, so you have a Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom panel. Um, and please just provide your questions there and then I'll curate them and we'll do a Q&A at the end um, of um, Dr. Malik's talk. Um, we are recording this talk and it'll get posted to our um, Center for Autism Research and Treatment CART websites um, shortly after the event in case um, you want to reference it again or send it to friends. So I am so incredibly pleased to invite our speaker, um, Dr. Marsha Malik. She, Dr. Malik's on our list every year um, to come and give a talk and we're so happy she was able to make it today, um, partly because the work she does is so unique and really um, fills a huge void actually in our field of developmental disabilities. Um, so Dr. Malik is the Vice Chancellor for Research and Graduate Education Emeritus at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, she received her PhD in social policy from Brandeis and then was actually an associate professor at Boston University before she moved to UW-Madison, where she's been a professor in uh, the School of Social Work, as well as the Vaughn Bascom and Elizabeth Boggs Professor in Pediatrics. Uh, the focus of Dr. Malik's research is really on the life course trajectory of developmental disabilities. Uh, she's really interested in how behavioral manifestations of specific developmental disabilities unfold, um, not just in autism spectrum disorder, but also in genetic syndromes such as fragile X and Down syndrome. And she particularly has focused on these really important periods of adolescence, adulthood, and old age, which again is an area that's really understudied in our field. Uh, she also really studies how the family environment affects the development of individuals with developmental disabilities, particularly in these later stages of life, and reciprocally how parents and siblings of individuals with disabilities are affected. Uh, again, just to emphasize, she's one of the few researchers in the world who has conducted such tremendous longitudinal studies of individuals with developmental disabilities into adulthood. Um, Dr. Malik has held many, held many other research, uh, leadership roles, um, including being the director of the UW IDDRC, the Intellectual Developmental Disabilities Research Center. She's also been the director of the postdoctoral training program in IDDs, um, and she serves as the chair of the scientific advisory board of the John Merck Fund Developmental Disabilities Program. Um, she's extensively funded, widely published. Um, I don't need to go into numbers. Her work speaks for itself, but she really has been a leader in the field of um, intellectual and developmental disabilities. And so we're truly um, thrilled and honored to have her uh, join us today. And with that, I'll turn it over. So thank you very much, Shafali and Dan, for your um, invitation um, and your willingness to let me come and interact with you today. It's a great privilege for me. Um, it's been a while since I've been there. Um, and I, I'm sorry it's not in person, but this is it's just great to have this opportunity to talk with you today and to be part of your lecture series. So thank you so much. Um, so what I'd like to do today is to talk about um, my research uh, mining electronic health records for discovering the phenotype of autism and fragile X syndrome. Um, and I'll just say a couple of words about this before jumping in. And that is, this is a journey that began about 10 years ago when um, I began interacting with the healthcare system in Wisconsin, which I'll tell you about in a few minutes. Um, and they were leaders in digitizing electronic health records. And somehow through very strange confluence of events, I ended up um, being able to become affiliated with them and they have opened up their records to us um, at the Wasteman Center and to, um, and I've just jumped right in and learned a huge amount through this journey. Um, and I'm looking for more collaborators um, with different healthcare records. So if that, that rings a bell with anybody, we can talk about it. So um, this is what I'd like to do today. Um, I wanna tell you about the Marshfield Clinic, which is the healthcare system that's the source of the electronic um, health records that I'll be talking about. Um, and then I'm gonna be touching on three examples of research based on our work mining the electronic health records of the Marshfield system. 
Um, and the first example asks the question, do women with ASD have more health problems than would be accept, expected by the separate effects of sex differences and um, ASD status alone. In other words, double jeopardy is sort of a colloquial way of thinking about that. Um, second example that I'll share with you is whether we can predict um, a diagnosis of fragile X syndrome five years prior to the time that a child or an adult gets a clinical diagnosis of fragile X syndrome. In other words, can, the, can we find patterns in the electronic health record that would help us accurately predict or identify individuals who later will get that diagnosis? And the third is um, also focused on the gene that causes fragile X syndrome, but instead of the syndrome, it's focused on the premutation um, of the um, of, Fred, of fMR1. And premutation carriers may have a range of health and mental health conditions, but the work is the ability to detect those conditions is confounded by the fact that they are parenting a child with a significant developmental disability, fragile X syndrome. So can we use the electronic health record to separate the effects of stressful parenting from the effects of having the premutation of the fMR1 gene? So that's the journey I'm gonna take you on today. We're doing some other things with um, the electronic health records, but these are the three examples I thought we would share. So this is a map of the state of Wisconsin um, and um, the Marshfield Clinic Healthcare System is a large private multi-specialty, multi-site group practice with um, records for 1.7 million patients. As you can see, it's located in the rural part of Wisconsin. It's not Madison, it's not Milwaukee, it's not Green Bay. Um, and nearly all residents of the area choose to receive their health care from this system. Uh, and I'll give you some specific statistics on that next. But one of the things that people say about Marshfield and this swath of area around it um, that the healthcare system serves is that very few people move into this area and very few people leave once they're there. So there's low mobility. That translates into longitudinal electronic health records because people um, stay with this healthcare system sometimes for their entire life. And the Marshfield Clinic is a, was a leader and early adopter of the idea of um, digitizing health records. So they went back to 1979 and digitized all their records. And they, so we have a 40 years of electronic health records on, um, on their patient population. <clears throat> Here's some statistics that I think are amazing. In their 50 locations, they have 700 physicians. The amazing part is that 97% of the residents of the geographic area use this healthcare system. They have record, they record 99% uh, of the deaths, 95% of the hospital discharges are from their hospitals and 90% of the outpatient visits in the region are within the Marshfield healthcare system. So it's pretty close to a popu really population level data. So a um, little bit more detail um, of the 1.7, million digitized patient, well, the 1.7 million digitized patient records were the ones that we used for the first two examples for, that I'm gonna be sharing with you in today's talk. And within the Marshfield um, corpus of data, there are 20,000 patients who are enrolled in what's known as the Personalized Medicine Research Project, PMRP. And those patients were enrolled in the early 2000s and they consented at that time for researchers to have access to their electronic health records, to, you, to link the records with banked DNA samples and to be contacted for additional research. And I'll say now, and I'm happy to answer questions about this if it's of interest. When they signed their consent forms in the early 2000s, the consent stipulated that they would not have access to the findings of research, including DNA. Um, and so that's the, that was the stipulation that this healthcare system imposed on the Personalized Medicine Research Project, primarily to prevent genetic data to be used in a discriminatory fashion. We can talk about that. And this biobank is the basis of our third research example that I'll share with you today. So before jumping into the 
examples, let me just say things about some things about the limitations and strengths of EHR data, electronic health record data. So starting with the limitations, um, there, these um, electronic health records contain, uh, were created for billing purposes. They were not created to ha have detailed um, clinical observations or nuances. And there's every physician I've ever talked to about my research who's not a big data guy or gal will talk about the fact that there's so much noise and error in the medical record that there can't be anything meaningful that can be extracted from it. But um, there is noise and error in the medical record. And nevertheless, I'm trying to conv convince you today that we can extract meaning from it. The records that we had access to had no indicators of quality of care or continuity of care. As I mentioned, Marshfield's a rural population it has very limited racial and ethnic diversity. The majority of the population is uh, Northern European from essentially from Bavaria, immigrants who originally came from Bavaria. So it's extremely homogeneous racially and ethnically. And there's clearly a need for replication of any um, research that's conducted using electronic health records. On the positive side, you know, we have big data, huge data. Um, and the data are larger in scope and longer in duration than is traditionally the case in research in neurodevelopmental disorders. We have access to the complete medical record on these individuals. Um, EHR data are amenable to hypothesis testing approaches as well as discovery approaches. And we and others have used something called the rule of two, which reduces the noise and error um, in the data. And um, for instance, if a child is referred for um, uh, a genetic test for fragile X syndrome, and it, it turns out not to have fragile X, then fragile X will appear in the, um, in the electronic health record because they had a test for that diagnosis. But a rule of two requires that the diagnosis occurs in the, or that, that code occurs on two occasions in the medical record. You can use rule of three or whatever, but then you have a different kind of error introduced into the, into the system. So everything I'm gonna be talking about today is based on rule of two, um, meaning that the diagnosis or the characteristic had to appear twice in the medical record. So here's the first example um, of whether the health profiles of adults with ASD um, uh, differ by sex and um, by ASD status to see whether there is double jeopardy for women. And this is work that was led by Leanne DeWalt. You see her picture there. She is um, my former postdoc and now my close colleague. She leads the USED at the Waisman Center. She's the director of it. So um, this is the key question. Are there unique profiles of women with ASD? We know that in the general population, women have more health problems than men. And we also know it's been well documented that people with ASD have more health problems than people who don't have ASD. But to the best of our knowledge, nobody has addressed, no prior study has addressed the question about whether women um, with ASD have double jeopardy or health problems than would be expected by their sex and ASD status additively. Um, there's been other um, prior EHR research on ASD, and I'll just mention one. Um, excellent paper by Lisa Crone, who used the Kaiser EHR system to study sex differences. And they did find that people with ASD had um, more health problems than people in the general population, and that women had more health with ASD had more health problems than men with ASD, but they didn't um, evaluate whether there was a difference in magnitude of the sex difference in the ASD population as compared to the sex difference in the general population. And that's what the focus of our question was here. Um, essentially, it's a statistical interaction effect, the sex by diagnosis interaction effect. So in the Marshfield system, there were 2,187 adults who had an ICD-9 code of autism, Asperger's pervasive developmental disorder, 299 codes on at least two occasions in their electronic health record, the rule of two. They were spanned ages 18 to 87 in 2008 when this data set was pulled. And we matched them on a ratio of 10 to one for controls. They were age and sex matched uh, to 21,870 controls. 
And we did very straightforward um, statistical analyses on these data, um, logistic regression and two-way ANOVAs. And part of the reason I chose this example to share with you is because it, it illustrates how conventional statistics can be used with these types of data. So we proceeded in two stages. First, we um, looked at seven health condition domains to see whether the patient had conditions in that domain. And then we um, evaluated healthcare utilization patterns by counting the number of medical visits for conditions in that domain in the medical record and analyzed our sex by ASD status interaction effect. Um, I'll say that the seven condition domains, health condition domains were those that were um, analyzed by Lisa Krohn. Um, so we based this work as an extension of the paper I just mentioned. And um, uh, the first, first we asked whether there were significantly more diet, diet whether, these, whether people with ASD were significantly more likely to have such diagnoses in um, their medical record than controls, and then whether males, um, females were more likely to have these diagnoses um, than males. Um, and you see that for the seven domains, cardiovascular, endocrine, gastrointestinal, neurologic, nutrition, psychiatric, and sleep, that people with ASD were significantly more likely to have um, diagnoses within this domain than controls. And for the first few of these, or the most of these people, women were more likely to have diagnoses in these domains than men. And here are the results of the interaction effects, which is the heart of this um, part of our work. And that is whether healthcare utilization suggested that women with ASD had quote unquote double jeopardy. Uh, in other words, more than one would expect by their sex or ASD status alone. And what you see is that, let's just look at the psychiatric conditions first, or um, as an example, the Y axis shows the number of visits for psychiatric conditions a whole range of them um, by um, individuals who are um, uh, the, the controls, they're the red line and individuals who have an autism diagnosis. And so these are psychiatric conditions other than aut autism. And you see that there's very little difference in psychiatric conditions in terms of the number of frequency of visits, the number of visits in the electronic health record for the controls between males and females, but for um, the people with, for the sample members with ASD, there was sharply more visits for psychiatric conditions for the women than for the men. And that's the significant interaction effect that you see noted underneath that panel. And although the Y axis is different in each of these um, four um, condition domains, you see it's the same pattern where women with ASD have sharply higher um, numbers of visits for conditions in that um, in that domain than either men with ASD or males or females in the general population. So what we concluded is there is double jeopardy in terms of health um, conditions for women with ASD, but we raise questions and you know, you all probably are in much better position to answer these questions than I am or to think with me about that. Um, but, you know, do women with um, ASD have less effective treatment by the healthcare system than men with ASD or that men, or compared to men and women in the general population? There's evidence that women have high, women with ASD have high stress and maybe some of these effects are um, uh, more evident uh, for, that maybe they're more stress related. Um, certainly a sleep domain may be a result of that. Um, there may be genetic liability or other biological differences that women with ASD experience. Um, and of course, the latency of diagnosis is longer, later. Women get with females with ASD get diagnosed later than males with ASD. And maybe during that long period of time where they were not properly diagnosed, um, health conditions began. But what we observe is this double jeopardy for psychiatric, neurological, nutritional, and sleep domains. Um, and it's, these are, this is a cause for concern in terms of caring for individuals with ASD. It also may be a clue into some of the sex difference work that is just so prominent 
um, within the field today. So let me switch to my next um, example. Very different, focused on fragile X syndrome. Um, and here the question is whether we can predict um, a diagnosis of fragile X syndrome years before the clinical diagnosis. And this is work that was just recently published in Genetics and Medicine led by my postdoc, um, Ari Zumovagar, you see her picture there. Um, and she, she's a computer scientist who is now devoting her career to um, developmental disabilities. So before delving into this, let me just tell you about this family. Um, so this is not a family from Marshfield, it's from another um, part of my research, but it illustrates what fragile X families are like um, often. Um, and on the very bottom of the slide, you see that there's a key so that um, if there's a blue quadrant, that's a diagnosed full mutation of fragile X syndrome. A red quadrant shows the premutation of fragile X syndrome and a black square on the left side um, is an autism diagnosis. And we don't have to go through the other ones um, right now, but basically this is a pedigree that was um, prepared by a genetic counselor who we worked with and the first generation, Charlotte and Cooper had four children. Um, let me see if I can use my pointer. Lucy, who ended up being the respondent in our study, the participant in our study. Um, her brother, Lucas, her sister, Brooke, and her sister, Haley. And, um, you know, they, they didn't have any reason to suspect that there were any issues in their family. Um, and then Lucy had, Lucy had a few children. Um, Mark um, had developmental disabilities and um, was uh, referred for genetic testing. And um, it turns out that Mark has the full mutation of fragile X syndrome. His brother, Matthew, um, uh, has also fragile X syndrome and autism. And his sister, Maggie, has the premutation of, of uh, fMR1 gene. Um, one thing we could say about this is this is a family who, di who um, diverged um, in terms of their interest in being tested because Lucas was never tested, the brother of the original participant. Brooke, her sister, refused testing. And Haley, the other sister, um, she was tested. And that's how Haley and Lucy found out that they were um, Premutation carriers. This was cascade testing that was done after Mark was diagnosed. And so what happens is you can follow the generational patterns that Haley had two children who are affected and one who didn't. Brooke, um, her daughter Rosie, who also wasn't tested until she had two children with fragile X syndrome. Uh, and uh, working all the way over to the left, uh, Maggie um, had two children, one with uh, fragile X syndrome and autism and one with um, the premutation. So basically, Charlotte and Cooper um, uh, had, uh, they, from this marriage, um, I think there were 13 people who were affected either with fragile X syndrome or the premutation of fragile X. And the suspected source of this is the father. Um, he was deceased by the time the cascade testing was done, but um, the mother, Charlotte, tested negative. So this is a complex pedigree, but it's not atypical. Um, so are there patterns in the um, electronic health records that can predict who will later receive a diagnosis of fragile X syndrome? Because if we think back to this family, a lot of things happened after um, that could have been um, uh, accelerated with prompt diagnosis. Now, fragile X, and I'll show you the data about this, is significantly underdiagnosed. Um, uh, condition, a significantly underdiagnosed condition, despite the fact that the American Academy on Pediatrics and the American Academy on Neurology um, both have guidelines that recommend genetic testing for individuals with developmental disabilities where there isn't a different uh, genetic diagnosis. For those who ultimately receive the diagnosis, it takes a long time. The diagnostic odyssey averages about 18 to 24 months, but af after parents express concerns, but it can be much longer. And there have been clinical reports of many medical conditions associated with um, fragile X syndrome, but there hasn't been a previous complete unbiased population study to discover um, the prevalence of these conditions. So in order to pursue this, we, um, uh, we proceeded in three steps. First, we 
identified the patients who were clinically diagnosed with fragile X syndrome from the 1.7 million electronic health records in the Marshfield system. And we quantified the extent of underdiagnosis. And I'll tell you now that 55 patients had a diagnosis of fragile X syndrome and survived the rule of two of the 1.7 million. One could say, well, what can you do with 55 patients? Um, but we were able to learn a lot. Then we attempted to differentiate the cases diagnosed with Fragile X um, from controls only using physical health codes. In other words, we didn't use any neurological or mental disorder codes, but we tried to ident identify the physical health codes that would differentiate these, those with Fragile X from those <clears throat> in the controls to identify the burden of disease. And lastly, we the big part of our study was to predict Fragile X from the electronic health record five years before clinical diagnosis, not using any genetic data or any family history data. And we created a timeline of the codes that preceded the clinical diagnosis. So um, we, to estimate the, the true prevalence of Fragile X, we based our work on Jessica Hunter's paper from 2013, which is a meta-analysis of many other studies. Um, as I told you, there were 55 cases diagnosed in the Marshfield system. There would have, there, based on Jessica's prediction from her meta-analysis, we should have seen one, 196 cases in the Marshfield system, and that's 28% of the expected number of cases with fragile X syndrome. The median age of diagnosis there was 13. We had access to a university healthcare system with a larger number of records, 2.1 million patient records. There, 86 cases were diagnosed with Fragile X. We would have expected based on Jessica Hunter's um, algorithm or calculations that there would be 239. So this is 36% of the expected number of cases. Not that different, but very surprisingly, again, the median age of diagnosis in this non-overlapping healthcare um, system was age 13. So this quantifies at least in two healthcare systems that rate of underdiagnosis being, let's say, a quarter to a third of the um, cases that are diagnosed and the rate of underdiagnosis is, is 75% or um, 66%. Marcia, can I just ask a clarifying question? I, I, um, how certain are we about the, uh, about the, you know, the expected, you know, have, has that been really well validated? Is that really a good you know, in other words, is the expected really reasonable? Maybe your number is more, of course, it's probably an under ascertainment, but. Yeah. Well, I think you're asking a really important question. We have no idea what the true prevalence of fragile X syndrome is, even though it is the most prevalent single gene cause of autism or de and developmental disabilities. So I think one very important study that needs to be done is a population study of the prevalence of fragile X. But this is, I think, the best estimate we. I could find, and it. Um, so your your question is completely valid. We don't know um, whether those numbers are exactly correct. I'm sure we're underdiagnosing them. Okay, so I do want to say something about the bias that I think comes from this underdiagnosis. You know, there is this unknown true population, whatever size it is. Then some individuals who have developmental disabilities are referred for genetic testing of fragile X. And then some of them agree to cascade testing of their family. And some of the family members agree and some do not, as we saw with the pedigree that I showed you. We know, you know, it's, we've always known that there's questions of trust in um, the research and clinical community that's been highlighted tremendously during this pandemic, who is willing to engage with us in our research or our clinical trials, who will enroll in registries, um, who will participate in research, even if they enrolled in registries. You know, we don't know if this is really a triangle or if it's some other geometric shape, but I think we have to be mindful of the fact that we study a subset of that population. Um, so this is what we did. Once we moved to the second phase of our this particular study, we used the physical health codes um, uh, in the record, we use machine learning to differentiate, try to differentiate the fragile individuals with fragile X from the controls. Um, this is again without neurological or mental disorder codes, and we were um, 
highly successful. The AURSC is 0.77, it's very significant. The blue line on the Manhattan plot shows you the 0.05 level of significance. The red line, the little dots above it, each one of them um, represents a diagnostic code um, at the O1 level of significance differentiating the two groups. Uh, 26 of them survived Bonferroni correction. And let me just give you two examples. This is heart valve disorders affecting uh, people with fragile X syndrome five times more frequently than the controls. There are about twice as many medical encounters for those with fragile X syndrome who have this diagnosis than those in the controls who also have this diagnosis. And the median age of diagnosis is much younger. This is this little um, uh, symbol represents intestinal obstruction six times more frequent in the fragile X population. I, again, 20, almost the same number of medical encounters and uh, twice as much as in the controls and starting at a much younger age. So from this part of our um, project, we concluded that fragile X syndrome is a multi-system disorder. Our paper details all of this in terms of all of those little symbols and what all the um, uh, health, the physical health disorders that were successfully differentiating the, those with the premium, those with fragile X syndrome from the controls. There's this incredibly high burden of disease in fragile X beyond neurological and psychiatric conditions that start at a younger age and have more medical encounters. And many of these are very serious and actionable uh, medical conditions. Some of them have not appeared in the literature before. So our ultimate um, question for this pro project was whether we could predict fragile X syndrome spot five years prior to the diagnosis. The goal is of course, accelerating clinical diagnosis, reduce the diagnostic odyssey for families. Um, so of the 55 cases in the Marshfield system, 36 of them were diagnosed at age 10 or later. Um, and we chose this subgroup, recognizing that it made a small sample even smaller because we wanted time to be able to look back into the electronic health record prior to the time of diagnosis and see if we could make the prediction. So those 36 cases where um, age and sex matched with uh, 3,600 controls, um, and we use machine learning to analyze the electronic health record codes um, entered into the medical record at least five years before the clinical diagnosis. Again, we use now family history or genetic data to make the prediction. So not going through all of the details, um, basically if the, um, the, um, the, the green line, the cases on the bottom is all, all 36 cases and the prediction was highly significant. The AURC was 0.8. Um, if we just looked at those few cases diagnosed between 10 and 20, because this is a small sample, the AURC was even higher. And even those diagnosed after age 20, um, we were able to make that, that prediction. Um, so let me tell you specifically about what we saw here. So this is age on the y-axis. And um, what you see is that speech and language delay is diagnosed at a very young age um, for um, the is the first diagnosis that appears in the record, um, followed by developmental disabilities. And these, um, these are conditions that should have triggered a, a genetic test for um, fragile X syndrome right away. Then there is um, ADHD that appears in the medical record not much later, and anxiety diagnoses and intellectual disability. And then over here is AIFXS. That's the artificial intelligence um, diagnosis of fragile X that showed the differentiation that I mentioned earlier. So with highly significant um, effects, we were able to diagnose, to identify who would later get the diagnosis of fragile X versus those who had not five years before the clinical diagnosis. So to summarize this project, um, there is an alarming, um, rate of underdiagnosis of fragile X that we saw in two healthcare systems, if we believe the estimates from Jessica Hunter's paper, which um, is I think the best we have. Uh, we were able to identify patterns in the electronic health record to discover con health conditions other than psychiatric and neurological 
to show that Fragile X is associated with a very high burden of disease and identify many actionable conditions. And, you know, obviously what we would hope to do with, is to think of using these data to create a tool that could alert um, physicians in the medical record to accelerate the diagnosis of Fragile X syndrome. Um, I think, um, I think there are complications in assuming that that would necessarily solve the problem, but it may help the problem, um, may help reduce the underdiagnosis and the long diagnostic odyssey. So my last example um, is examining um, uh, genotype phenotype associations in pre-mutation carriers of the gene that causes fragile X syndrome. So um, this mom and dad have three children. The mom, it turns out, is a pre-mutation carrier of um, the gene that causes Fragile X syndrome. Um, her older daughter was diagnosed with autism, um, and she already had her second child, uh, who also received an autism diagnosis. And while she was pregnant with the third child, someone suggested a Fragile X, getting the girls tested for Fragile X. And, Turns out all three of these children have full mutation fragile X syndrome and the girls both have an autism diagnosis as well. Um, so fragile X syndrome is defined by more than 200 CGG repeats in the fMR1 gene. The pre-mutation, which exists in earlier generations, has fewer repeats um, from 55 to 200 CGG repeats in the gene and mothers can transmit an expansion of the CGG repeat to their children, as we saw in this example and in the prior example of um, Charlotte and Cooper. But there's controversy in the uh, literature about whether parenting children with fragile X, even one child with fragile X syndrome, so the stress of that is uh, potentially causing certain phenotypic characteristics that have been reported, or is there a biological effect of the premutation itself? So um, limitations in all past research on premutation carriers is that carriers were identify, are identified through cascade testing, as I showed you before, that this is what I refer to as reverse ascertainment, the child with fragile X is diagnosed, and then they cascade test the families, and then working back and throughout the family, they identify who is a carrier, a premutation carrier. And therefore, we don't know whether the individuals diagnosed as carriers this way uh, are representative or are they biased? So let me just say a couple of words about bias and then jump into the results. Um, so the bias is, there's a huge number of sources of bias affecting what we know. Uh, one of them is genetic bias because the larger the number of CGG repeats, the greater the probability of the mother transmitting fragile X to their child. Consequently, we know less about the effect of the premutation in mothers who have fewer repeats. There's bias based on uh, which children get genetic testing. We've talked about that, which families are interested in participating in research, self-selection bias. There's also the suspicion, um, not my suspicion, but there is suspicion um, that premutation carriers read the medical literature, the clinical literature, and that therefore more likely to over-report symptoms. So it's possible that the self-reported symptoms are not valid. So there's a need for unbiased population-based research in this condition, the premutation. Um, there's well accepted evidence that there are two syndromes that are um, characteristic premutation carriers. One is called FAXTAS, fragile X-associated tremor ataxia syndrome, which is a neurodegenerative disorder um, that has an onset after age 50. It's um, more prevalent in males with the premutation than females, but evident in both. And there is also a FAX-POI, Fragile X Primary Ovarian Insufficiency, which is early menopause and a series of reproductive symptoms. About a quarter of women with the premutation have FAX-POI. But then there are, there's lots of reports about elevated rates of anxiety and depression and other sort of maybe nonspecific health problems in premutation carriers leading to this fundamental question about whether, they're, whether the psychiatric conditions in particular are the reactive effects of stressful parenting for a child with 
uh, fragile X syndrome or the biological effects of the premutation. And we sought to separate those out. So for this, we turn to the other part of the Marshfield electronic health record world, the Personalized Medicine Research Project, PMRP. And this is what, to the best of our knowledge, the first US population-based biobank linking people who have fMRI one specific fMRI one CGG repeats and their electronic health records. So there are 20,000 adult members in PMRP with banked DNA samples. And this was a huge effort. We screened and assayed all of these DNA samples, all 20,000 DNA samples for the number of CGG repeats they had. So we have people with as few as nine repeats and people as high as um, close to 200 repeats that we were able to identify. And of the 72 women and 26 men of the 20,000 have repeat numbers in the pre-mutation range, 55 to 200 repeats. And they are unaware of their pre-mutation status. So if they report their certain health problems, they're not doing this because they read the clinical literature on the pre-mutation of the fMRI1 gene. So this gave us an opportunity to probe genotype, phenotype associations, less unconfounded by the bias, sources of bias that I talked about earlier, and especially unconfounded by having a child with fragile, fragile X syndrome. So we looked into the medical record to determine whether there's evidence of the motor phenotype, tremor, gait instability, falls, neurodegenerative symptoms, the reproductive phenotype, early menopause, infertility, menstrual symptoms, and the psychiatric phenotype, which is primarily anxiety and depression. Some people think the premutation is a normal variant. We thought we could check that out. And this is essentially a double blind experiment because neither the patient nor their physician who was treating them and entering the codes into the medical record was aware of how many CGG repeats they had, whether they were premutation carriers or not. And so this is also work done um, by my, um, my, my postdoc, Ari Zumovagar, when she was a graduate student. And this was a paper that came out a couple of years ago in Science Advances. And this is our study design. Um, so as I said, there were 72 women and 26 men with the premutation, and we compared them with a uh, thousand controls, normal controls with number of repeats that were right in the normal range of CGG repeats, and they were matched on age and sex and the duration of time that they were receiving care in the medical record. Um, we used machine learning and linear regression to try to address our question. I'm not gonna spend time on this slide because I'm gonna run out of time, but I'm happy to come back and tell you the step-by-step -step procedures we used if anyone is interested in them, and they are in the paper. And we use something called FIWAS um, to differentiate those with premutation care, the premutation from controls. And FIWAS, unlike GWAS, FIWAS is used when the gene is known and we're seeking to identify, to identify the phenotypes associated with the gene. And uh, FIWAS allows us to create these fee codes and fee codes group together billing codes into cl clinically meaningful grouping. So, Major depressive disorder, which is a fee code, combines single episode, unspecified degree, moderate degree, severe degree, et cetera, et cetera, and others not listed here. All, all are codes associated with major depressive disorder. And it makes it possible to interpret the results. So we identified the fee codes that significantly differentiated premutation carriers from controls, and here we used multiple regression. So here is a Manhattan plot that um, shows you the, the annotated conditions in this Manhattan plot are the ones that were above the 0.01 level of significance. And we, this is for females, um, the 72 females versus the controls, the 494 controls. The AUROC was 0.6, um, highly significant. Um, uh, let me just draw a circle around. This is the psychiatric phenotype associated with the premutation. Agoraphobia, social phobia, and panic disorder were significantly elevated. This is the um, reproductive phenotype associated with uh, the premutation, irregular menstrual bleeding, dysmenorrhea, infertility. And then 
this is, we don't know exactly how to interpret this. This is uh, fractures of the upper limb and the radius and ulna and rotator cuff um, problems and neuralgia and neuritis and radiculitis. This constellation of phenotypes may have been a result of the falls and tremor and gait instability that is part of the FAXTAS syndrome. Or it could be the result of um, uh, osteoporosis that's associated with early um, uh, menopause. We don't know, but this constellation clearly um, is evident. The, this analysis was done for um, uh, codes that appeared in the medical record of these females before age 40. The paper also shows before age 60, before age 80 and lifetime codes um, that show similar patterns. Here's the males, 26 males um, with the pre-mutation versus 507 controls. The AURC again, significant 0.6, even with such a small number. You see the mental disorders, uh, mood disorders, major depressive disorders, and other specified non-psychotic and or transient me mental disorders. And also a uh, phenotype that's part of uh, fax test syndrome, um, having to do with urinary incontinence and disorders of the urinary system. And those are the two confirmatory um, sets of fee codes that we identified, but all the other codes that I'm not pointing out right now are characteristics that differentiated the pre those with the premutation from the controls. So um, to conclude, um, the electronic health record did provide unbiased confirmation of aspects of the premutation phenotype, um, particularly the mental health phenotype that was this is the subject of quite a bit of controversy. It is a double-blind study because neither the participant nor the physicians were aware of the fragile X premutation versus control group status. They were not reverse ascertained, um, but rather a population-based sample. And if you believe that the electronic health record has objective data, this is based on objective data and identifies actionable clinical symptoms. So to wrap up, what did we learn or what can be learned from electronic health records? Um, they're a great opportunity for population-based unbiased analyses. Um, we, we have used them and they can be used to estimate the prevalence of disorders. And as you, you see that they're amenable to both hypothesis testing and discovery approaches. They're amenable to conventional statistics and complex methods like machine learning. I think they give us insight into real world patterns of medical care and general healthcare settings rather than in the specialized clinics where we work or in volunteer samples such as those that I have spent my career studying. Um, they can complement and integrate with other types of data like biomarkers and clinical assessments, observational paradigms, genetics, but there's a huge need for replication across EHR systems. So just to wrap up, um, the uh, huge thanks to, a hu to the Marshfield Clinic for sharing their data with us. It's just amazing. Um, and I'd like to point out the uh, work that May Baker, May Wang Baker at UW and Liz Berry Kravis at Rush did to assay all 20,000 of these, of uh, the cases within the Personalized Medicine Research Project. Murray Brilliant is truly brilliant. He is our collaborator from Marshfield and now at the Waisman Center. Leanne DeWalt led the first example, the one focused on six differences um, in ASD, in adults with ASD. Jean Kong does everything data for our um, research group. Arizu Movagar is the graduate student and now postdoc who led the second two research um, uh, examples. David Page, who used to be at Wisconsin, he's now the chair of biostatistics at Duke and he continues to collaborate with us. Danielle Schultz is a clinician at the Wasteman Center and she's been incredibly helpful in um, probing the validity of some of the observations that come out of this analysis. And Julie Taylor, my former postdoc who's at Vanderbilt and she has been part of this work as well. And um, I mentioned the funding sources there that we've benefited from in this particular work. And with that, I'll stop talking and take your questions. <laughs>